Welcome, I'm Jackie Jacob at the University of Kentucky and I'm the coordinator for the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice on eExtension. And one of my responsibilities is to organize our monthly webinar. Uh, this month's webinar is on avian genetics. This came about as a request from uh, an attendee in a previous webinar. If at any time you have an idea for a webinar, feel free to put it in the chat box and we'll see if we can uh, get it in a uh, upcoming months. So as I said, uh, this month's is avian genetics, introduction to poultry breeding. We have two speakers. Uh, Darren Karcher from uh, Purdue, recently moved from Michigan State, will be uh, talking first, give you a little bit more on, on avian genetics, and then uh, Dr. David Frame from um, Utah State University will go into more of the practical aspects of um, poultry breeding. So um, all yours, Darren. Thank you, Jackie. Good afternoon, everyone. So today I have the pleasure of giving you some background related to avian genetics. When we talk about avian genetics, we're really trying to talk about characterizing traits that cause differences or similarities in our population of birds. So this may be individuals and we're looking at how their particular genetic makeup versus the type of environment they're in or the interactions of those two and how that influences the particular phenotype or the way that those birds look to you um, and get a better understanding of that. Now traditionally genetics was based more in the study of mutations and so we would look for birds or um, other animals that did not look anything like the parents and then try to figure out exactly what changed in the genetic makeup that resulted in that mutation. Uh, uh, an example of that would be if we look at our commercial turkeys, we have the wild turkey or the bronze turkey, and the white commercial turkey was actually a feather mutation that resulted in a white bird being produced. And then we decided to select birds that had this mutation in order to produce a white bird. Today, though, most of our genetic evaluation is done more at the DNA level with markers, looking at things like the quantitative trait loci, which means that we're looking at the DNA itself and trying to identify genes that are responsible for a particular um, thing that we're interested in. For example, it could be trying to identify uh, the QTLs that are responsible for better feed conversion in our birds or um, QTLs that are related to increased egg production at the DNA level. So what I wanted to do today was kind of set the background for what uh, Dr. Frame will be discussing later. And to do that, I think we need to have a better understanding of some of the terminology used in genetics. So if we start out and we look at this picture here, this is called a homolog. Now a homolog is consisting of two individual chromosomes that come together. And so when we look at these um, chromosomes, we are looking for one of these chromosomes that was generated by uh, the female or the mother and one that was generated by the male. So when we look then at these particular chromosomes, we notice that we have a locus or what are gene loci. And these individual gene loci are um, the particular genes that we are interested in evaluating. Now, if you notice at each of these genes then, in this case, we have either a capital P in, in the first gene, or we have a lower case A in the second gene, or we have a capital B and a lower case B in the third gene. Well, what we're talking about here are different alleles or different forms of the same gene. And in this case, if we talk about a dominant allele, it will always be a capital letter. And if we talk about a recessive allele, it will always be a lowercase letter. Now, I, I turned this types and goats because I was trying to figure out the 
best way to kind of explain this to you. So if you take my family and myself and my wife, and then you look at our five kids, we have very different looking five kids. Now they may all look similar, but there are subtle differences. So what we're looking at at this case is the phenotype or what is expressed in each of these individuals. Now, if we focus in on one of my sons, now we can look that at his particular phenotype, but we want to go a little bit deeper and look at his genotype. So what do we mean by genotype? What we're trying to discern is when we look at a particular type of gene, what sort of alleles are being expressed? This is where the heterozygote and homozygotes come into play. If we take the letter A or this first gene, he is a heterozygote for this gene because he carries both the dominant and the recessive allele. However, if we look at the last one, letter D here, he's a homozygote because he only carries the same allele, the capital D, for both of those genes. So when we start thinking about our birds and our breeding strategies, it helps us if we can actually start to understand the genotype and what types of genes they are carrying because we may find in the offspring that certain things are being expressed that we anticipate or there's certain things expressed that we don't anticipate. And it comes back to understanding if they are homozygote or heterozygote for a particular gene. Now, some other things that I think you need to understand if we talk about the epistasis, we're looking at the allele of one gene and it can actually hide the phenotype of another gene. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later on. We can also talk about uh, the dominant. So we have a dominant allele like we've talked, which means that that gene will display that trait. If we have a recessive allele, then we have to have two copies of those alleles in order to express that trait. And in some instances, we may have what is called incomplete dominance, where we have both alleles and they're expressed together and the result is a blended phenotype. Now, a good example of incomplete dominance that I think we can all visualize very quickly is if we take a red flower, we take a white flower, if we breed them together and they each have the allele being expressed, we may end up with a pink flower. So it's neither red nor white, it's a combination or a blend of both. Now, when we talk about nor uh, nomenclature or how things are expressed when we start uh, referring to the genotype of things, we will find that if we see a positive sign or a plus sign, that means it's the wild type. So that is what is normally found in nature. If it's a capital letter, it's the dominant allele. A lowercase letter, it's a recessive allele. And then usually we use a dash like that or a, um, a backslash to indicate which chromosome it may be present on. So now let's talk a little bit more about chromosomes. Now, when I show you this picture, this is called the avian karyotype. And we can, and you can actually have this done on yourself and you could have your own karyotype if you wanted. What this is, is it's a physical representation or a picture of all the types of chromosomes that are present within that respective bird or animal that you're looking at. So in this case, if we look at one through five here, we can see that those are the major chromosomes or the macro chromosomes. And then six through 38 are what are termed micro chromosomes. And those are something unique to birds. You can also see down in the corner here, we have Z and W, which are the sex chromosomes, very similar to the X's and Y's that are present within humans and some of the other animal species. Now, if you look at one through five, you'll notice that the shape of these chromosomes are very different. So when we look at the morphology of the chromosomes, it's going to come down to where these centromeres or where the two chromosomes come together in the homolog that indicates what type of morphology may be present. Now, while it, this may seem that it's not really important, when we started to look at mutations to have a better understanding of what was happening, in some instances, these short arms and long arms can break off and then rejoin in different places. And that's what actually causes the mutation is the relocation of a particular gene 
on someplace else within the chromosome. Now, when we talk about 2N, we're talking about genetic material. So if we look at chickens, we had 38 pairs of chromosomes, also referred to as the autosomes. Sorry. If we go the other way, we also had the X and W, so we had one pair of sex chromosome. So when we look at the total genetic content or how many chromosomes are present within a cell, we can take the 39 pairs, multiply that by two, you know, male and female, and we end up with 78 units of genetic material or chromosomes that are present. Now, while this may not seem relevant, I want to illustrate here that if we look across avian species, we can see some very big differences when we look at the number of chromosomes that are present. So if we look at the pheasant, we can see it has 82. And if we look at, a, at the quail, we can see that even though they're both within the same family of quail, Bob White and Japanese quail actually have a difference of four chromosomes. So over the evolution of the quail, somehow we have lost four chromosomes between the Bob White and the Japanese. Then when we look at the chicken, 78, the turkey, guinea, and pigeon, and they fluctuate. So just to give you some perspective about the difference in genetic material that makes up um, our avian species. Now, when we talk about sex chromosomes, we know when we talk about humans that we have X's and Y's. And so when we talk about our X's and Y's, we know that these two X's will segregate and form the gametes or the eggs, and it will have either an X or an X. When we look at the, the male, though, when the sperm is formed, we will end up with either an X or a Y. So in this case, with mammals, we know that the male will always dictate the sex of the offspring. Now on the other side, if we look at chickens, let's not confuse ourselves. So we'll start by calling them W's and Z's, since we're talking about an avian species. But I want you to notice that the difference this time is that the males will always produce a Z sperm, and the females will actually dictate if it ends up being a female or male, chick, poult, duckling, whatever is hatched. And so in this case, we see the role reversal of who dictates the um, sex of the offspring. Now, when we talk about genetic principles, you need to understand that with segregation, the law of segregation, that two alleles at a locus will separate during the formation of the gametes. So this goes back to the X and Y that we just talked about. So we're going to have the separation of the two. We'll have one form of the gene go one way and one form of the gene go the other way. Now, when we look at independent assortment, that means that they're going to independently segregate. So we're not sure that the capital A in this gene and the capital A for this other gene will go together. They will likely go independent or they could go together. Now, there are some cases where they may actually go together because they're so close to each other in that chromosome, and those are called linked. Something important to know, especially when you start to look at some of uh, the traits in poultry. For example, if we look at the crest gene, the frizzle gene, and the dominant white gene, two of those three are closely linked, and so depending on how they're located within that chromosome, you may find that you always get um, expression of crest and frizzle, maybe not dominant white. And so there's some things like that that it's important to understand uh, this linkage or independent assortment of genes. So we've talked about the dominant allele, I think, sufficiently, so we all understand what that means. The recessive, again, we understand that, but the one thing I want you to be aware of is this thing called dosage. So what it means is that the number of alleles of a certain type of gene will actually determine the level of phenotypic expression. And I'll give some examples here as we go. So now let's talk about specific genes, which I, you probably are a little more interested in. So unfortunately, nothing is as simple as we hope it will be. So <laughs> the first thing to understand when we talk about feather color development is that within 23 to 
40 hours of incubation, there are these cells called melanophores that begin to migrate throughout the body tissue of the embryo. By day four, they are present everywhere in that embryo. Now, there are two types. There are the black, which are the eumelanocytes, and there are the red or brown called the melanocytes. The reason it's important is that these melanophores and how they are regulated will dictate the color of feather that those birds will produce as they get older. Now, white seems like it should be very simple and very straightforward when we talk about expression. The first thing is that we have multiple genes that deal with white. The first one is dominant white, which is an incomplete dominant. So this gene prevents the expression or the synthesis of any black pigment. So an example would be our leghorn. So what that means is that if you have a white leghorn, that bird has dominant white present, and if it didn't have dominant white, you would actually have a, bla a black leghorn. We also have the silver gene. Silver gene is going to prevent the color of red and brown. So those birds that carry the silver gene are Brahmas and silver Columbians. So you, in theory, could think it's very easy to breed a white leghorn with a Brahma and still end up with something white. And in fact, they're two very independent genes and so you may not get the desired effect that you think you would get when you cross two white birds together. There's also something called recessive white as a third gene. And this prevents the pigment of any of our melanocytes. So no reds, no browns, and no blacks. An example of this would be the white rock. So we have the white rock, which has a recessive white. We have a leghorn that has a dominant white, and then we have our Brahmas or Colombians that are expressing the silver gene. Now, we thought white was complex. Let's talk about black. If we look in this list of black and we start at the very bottom, I've listed this in order of dominance. So what I mean is that if we have a recessive Wheaton gene present, and you also had the next level up, so the speckled gene present, you would find that that bird would express speckling and not the recessive Wheaton. And you continue on up the list. You can see here in the middle is the wild type for black. And then we end up with dominant black at the very top. So depending on what combinations of these black genes are present will dictate what sort of black or what sort of coloring is going to be present in your birds. So to give you an example, if we talk about any bird that has color, that means that it has the dominant wild type for recessive white. So if you have the recessive white gene in your bird and it is expressing color, it is the dominant form of that recessive white gene. Now, when we look at black, if we have the dominant Wheaton, you would get a New Hampshire color in black. If you have the dark brown or the brown black, you get the dark brown Leghorn color. And then if you have the recessive Wheaton, you get the Rhode Island red color. So knowing that if you would cross a Rhode Island red with a New Hampshire just in the color related to black gene, you would get the color of a New Hampshire as opposed to the color of a Rhode Island red when it comes to the black. So now I talked about dosage, dosage being where we have multiple genes and they dictate how much expression from a phenotype is expressed. Dwarfism is considered a dosage gene. And so dwarfism results in smaller birds. Overseas, it can be found more prevalent as they use that to help put more birds in a smaller area because the birds have a smaller body mass. So if we take a normal male, and for those of you that are not aware, this is the form or the symbol for male. So if we take a normal male and we cross it with a dwarf female, what we get is a normal male, but it will be a little bit smaller because it's got the dwarfism gene, and we end up with a completely normal female. So in this case, 
we see a little bit of a dosage compensation. So meaning that if you had um, one copy of the dwarfism gene, you see a little bit smaller body size, but not to the extent that we will see in the next example. Now, growing up in breeding and selecting breeding pens, I know that the hardest thing that we can do is try to select barring, especially when it comes to something like the barred rock. Well, barring is a dosage compensated gene, which means that if we take a male that is non-barred, or normal, and we take a barred female, what we end up with is a barred male and a normal female. Now, the important thing to understand is that if we would actually do another cross, we could end up where we have a male that has complete barring, a male that has some barring, and then a female that has barring. Now, how does that phenotypically express itself? What that means is that if you have a male that has two copies of the barring gene, you will get a very thick bar. If you have a male that has one copy, you will get a thinner bar. And in fact, the female that has the one copy will look very similar to the male that has one copy. So this is an example of dosage compensation. So in some instances, you may find when you breed barbed rocks, you get some that have very wide bars and some that get very thin bars. And it comes back to what type of gene they're carrying or which allele that dictates how thick that barring may be. Now, if we talk about comb types, when we talk about comb types, we have the Breda gene and the wild type is to show a comb. But in some instances, we will have the form that means it's combless. And then we will have a P comb, which means that we have the capital P because the, the wild type is the lowercase P, the lowercase R, and the lowercase D, which means that typically we would not see a P comb, not see a rose comb, and not see a duplex comb. So if we look at some different comb types, this would be the genetic makeup of a single combed chicken. They have the gene to show a comb, which is the Breda gene. But then P comb, Rose comb, and the duplex are all going to be wild type recessive, meaning that they do not have any dominant gene at all. Now, if we play with just the duplex gene, so we have the Breda, Breda wild type, so we're going to express a comb, and we play then with this duplex gene. If we have the buttercup, that is more dominant than wild type, and if we have the V-shaped, that is more dominant than the buttercup or the wild type. So you could have both the V-shaped and the buttercup, buttercup gene in a bird, and you would only see a a V-shaped comb present, even though they carry the potential to show a buttercup. In the next generation, when you breed that bird, if you bred it back to a single comb bird, you would get some birds then that express buttercup combs and some birds that express V-shaped combs. Now, if we talk about the rose and, oops, if we talk about the rose and the pea comb genes, we have found that males that have two dominant rose genes have lower fertility than those that have both a dominant and a recessive form of the rose comb. So when we look at the walnut combs, the cushion combs, strawberry combs, any of those, these are some of the different gene combinations that can be present resulting in those types of expression. So it could be that you have all dominant forms of those genes, that you have heterozygotes of the pea comb and homozygotes of the rose comb. You've got the potential for homozygotes of the pea comb and heterozygotes of the rose comb, or they're just all around heterozygotes for both of those genes. So when you start playing with, with comb types, depending on how you're breeding them, may result in unexpected consequences 
with respect to the comb type, depending on what the genetic background is for those particular genes. Now, the other thing that we can talk about are sex-linked genes. Now, sex-linked genes, in this case, is slow feathering. So if we take a male that is normal and we cross it with a female that is um, slow, what we end up with then are males that will be slow feathered and females that only carry fast feathering or normal feathering for that gene. This is what is actually prevalent in our broiler industry for the commercial birds, where at day of hatch, you can actually sex males and females based on the way that these feathers look in the primaries so that you either have normal or you have what looks like a sawtooth and you have the slow. You would know then that the slow is always the male and the normal looking is always the female. This is due to the fact that it's located on the Z chromosome. And so when we are, yes, on the Z chromosome. And so when we look at that, that's why it's called sex linked. Another example of this is when we talk about the barn. So we've talked about the dosage effect and we know what can happen from that perspective. But the other thing is that it's also linked to the Z chromosome. So what happens is we get an interruption of the color on the top of the head. So we can actually sex the chicks then if they have the barring gene to differentiate if they're males or females because of the way that they have lack of pigment on the very top of their head. So, to sum up what I've talked about so far today, genetics is very complex and it can seem very overwhelming, but sometimes the best way to approach it is to try by error, or you set up some different breeding pens and you look at what the results are to help you figure out if the males or females have a particular type of gene that you're interested in. The classic genetics like I've described here is still very relevant to you as small flock and as fanciers, and it's a fantastic way to help you really advance your um, particular genetic strain that you're looking at trying to populate. And then last but not least, the best approach sometimes is just to practice, practice, and practice. With that, now I'll turn it over to David Frame. We have a question first. Sure. Uh, somebody wants to know in the rose combs for the lower fertility and what breed or breeds were that studied? Do you know? Um, so going back to the 40s and 50s, uh, those would have been in what we call rose combs uh, was the population breed, but then they would have studied that likely linking it over to like the legger where they had more control over the particular genetics. And so it's something that has stood up over time irrespective of the type of background that the rose gene rose comb gene is present in um, so it's applicable irrespective of the particular type of um, chicken that you may have okay thank you very much darren oh, you're uh, welcome. stick around and uh if you unshare yep we can get david sharing yep you start your uh Perfect. So our uh, second speaker, as I said, is Dr. David Frame, uh, uh, Extension Poultry Specialist at Utah State University. It's all yours, David. Oh, just Thanks. to just to point out, David does not have a webcam, so you can't get you can't see him, but uh, you should be able to hear him. Sorry about that, but uh, at least you can envision me anyway. But uh, appreciate that, Jackie, and uh, thanks, Dr. Kartzer, for that um, introduction. And you've covered a lot of what um, I plan on doing as far as maybe looking at it in a little more pract practical way. But um, I'm just going to touch on a few basic principles in some of the main genes associated with with plumage, and that's all I'm going to concentrate on um, in my part of the pr presentation. And certainly it's not all comprehensive and, and not all inclusive, but uh, hopefully it will give you some idea of how, um, why a chicken looks the way it does. And my goal is, is if I can get you thinking and questioning about why a chicken looks the way it does, then I've pretty much accomplished what I'd like to do here. Um, 
And in plumage genetics, there's basically three colors, actually two colors, and then white is the lack of color. But uh, the base colors in chickens are either going to be black, they're going to be white, or they're going to be red or gold. In feathers, um, these colors are made up of a combination of genes that mask or enhance the black or red pigments that are produced. And uh, these masking and enhancing genes can affect various uh, features, um, different uh, feather groups on, on the bird itself. The main color patterns, um, if you have a solid bird, it can be, as I mentioned, black, white, uh, red, gold, or buff colored. And, um, and then there's what's called party colored uh, varieties. And in chicken vernacular, in, in plumage, we consider breeds and then uh, varieties within that breed. For instance, a, a Plymouth Rock can have various uh, varieties. The barred Plymouth Rock that we talked about a little bit earlier, um, white Plymouth Rock, um, and so forth. And so on these party colored um, uh, varieties, uh, that means that they have at least one or two different colors, two different colors in, in their plumage. And a good example of that would be the black-breasted red plumage, which is the wild type. And that's actually what the, um, the jungle fowl has, and that's where uh, our chickens originated from. And uh, they do have a few genes interspersed there with the green jungle fowl and some others that uh, cause some genetic diversity there. But um, the uh, black-breasted red can also be uh, that basic pattern with um, inhibitor gene on the black can become what's called a pile. Um, I'll show you a picture of that later. Another couple of uh, pairs would be a birchen versus a brown red and a partridge uh, versus a silver penciled. And then there's a bunch of other um, patterns, barring, lacing, splash, spangling. Um, and we're unfortunately not going to get to all of those, but uh, uh, that gives you a little bit of a flavor for the arrays that, of colors that, that go there. Now I'm going to take um, a couple of examples here, um, uh, quick examples. Now we talked about that uh, C gene, and um, we're talking about autosomal um, genes here, which means that both the female and the male have two alleles for those. and um, so if we look at a, at a, a black distribution, uh, a black bird would have the ability, and in this case it's homozygous for the black, um, the melanophores to uh, produce themselves, and um, both the male and the female are, are homozygous. And in order for black to be expressed, it requires a, another extender gene, uh, basically, for it to be expressed throughout the body. And, um, and so for my case here, uh, we'll have um, the dominant extender on both of those, so it allows the black to go completely through. So if we take a male and a female that are homozygous for these two um, traits, then what we end up with is um, the progeny will all be black because they'll all be homozygous for the uh, color, which is the black, and then the extender also. And so regardless of male versus female, they will all be um, the same color. Here's an example of a uh, black cochin male, and you can see that the black is extended throughout the body. One thing I want to mention here is that you'll see uh, kind of a greenish sheen on the bird, and um, when we think about colors, it's not necessarily just uh, two-dimensional. It could be three-dimensional within that feather, and those melanophores can um, uh, place themselves in such a way that it will cause uh, light refraction. And what we see here is a greenish sheen on um, on these feathers. Um, this is a this is normal for a, a green sheen on a black bird. Um, occasionally, you'll see um, if you look at at a bird um, that's had feather damage or that it had some nutritional problems at a certain state stage when that feather was being developed. You'll see a little bit of a plum barring that comes across there, um, and so. That just means the melanophores have been put in a different position to refract a, a different color. Um, so here's a, an example of a of a cochin, and this is a um, old English game bantam. And uh, again, you see the black um, sheen on it, and, and the black being extended throughout the 
the body of this bird. Okay, uh, white is not necessarily a white is not a white, and uh, uh, we'll review this a little bit, but uh, in this case, the autosomal recessive white um, is that same C gene, and in this case, it uh, is not allowing it the, the uh, black formation, and so if you do have a homozygous um, uh, female and a homozygous male, uh, and you breed those two together, the offspring is going to be all white. Um, they, this is uh, pretty much demonstrated in, in some breeds such as the, um, the white Plymouth Rock. And, and so you can see that that white extends itself um, completely through. Now, it's not apparent phenotypically what white is what white, but, um, but they all look pretty much the same. Um, when we talk about the, the dominant white um, that Dr. Karcher talked about, uh, it's actually a black restrictor. Um, and in the case of um, being homozygous, it will completely knock out the black. And so even though uh, these um, parents have their homozygous for black, and they're homozygous for extending that black throughout the body, um, this gene here will block it so that that doesn't occur. And um, in a case of um, homozygous parents, you're going, you're going to get um, all-white progeny. And a good example of that is the, uh, the white leghorn that is our standard for uh, commercial production. And um, there are some, um, some of your uh, exhibition strains also, but uh, there's a good possibility that some of those exhibition strains may be, um, may be recessive white too. And uh, you can't tell the difference. I mean, they, they look just exactly like those white rocks that we, we looked at uh, a minute ago. So now just as an example of another autosomal partial um, uh, type gene that covers up black, uh, there's a really pretty um, bird called the, the Blue Andalusian. And um, this bird is actually a Mediterranean um, class chicken, but it has a, a color that approaches kind of a blue color. And unfortunately, I don't have a live picture of this, but um, but basically, uh, there's a gene um, similar to that uh, I gene that we talked about, but in the heterozygous state, it will allow some of the black to come through. So in, in this case, we have uh, the ability of both the mother and the father to um, express black, and uh, th it can be extended, but um, only in the heterozygous state, where you only have one of those alleles uh, being the dominant um, um, blue gene here, it, it will kind of let the black, the black leak out and it comes out as a gray color, so is what we call a, a color blue. What's interesting here is that um, if you have um, heterozygous parents on this, you're going to get a, an array of different progeny out of this. And uh, if it follows the genetic um, model uh, exactly, um, theoretically, you would get about 25% of those birds that would have the dominant allele of both of those, they would be phenotypically either white or um, splash if some of the uh, some of the black did come through. However, I just use mathematics, and you can see that the, there's basically two ways that you can get genes from father and mother on these, and uh, theoretically, 50% of the progeny would have the the blue color to them. And if they if neither of them has have the, this inhibitor then they would come out black. So there's another example of, a, of an autosomal uh, type gene. We talked a little bit about the, the sex-linked um, barring. There are, there's actually two types of barring. There's a sex-linked barring, and there's also an autosomal barring. But uh, in this example, what I want to give you is the sex-linked barring because it's very familiar in our, our barred Plymouth rocks particularly. Uh, again, <laughs> On the Z chromosome, um, you can get two sets, um, and on on the male, and only one on the female. And so, in this case, uh, if you took a, a male that uh, was not barred, and a female that, that did show barring, and crossed them, you get certain things. Now, a classic ex example of this would be, um, say, a, a New Hampshire uh, male, and a 
in a barred Plymouth Rock female crossed. Uh, the progeny, there will be some barring in the males, um, and there'll be no barring in the females, and, and so you can at hatch and, uh, and, and young in life be able to tell which ones are the, the females and which ones are the, the males. And so now we have a way of sexing birds by plumage characteristics. Um, Dr. Karcher talked about the sexing on the um, slow versus fast feathering. The, the barred um, barring on these birds is actually because of inhi inhibition of the black being expressed. And so um, in, in a barred rock, Basically, you've got a black bird, but then you've got this barring over the top that causes uh, causes different spots, different areas on the feathers to not to exhibit the, the black. Um, and again, the, ma the male has two alleles for this. And so um, if uh, you're looking at uh, good exhibition type birds, for optimal um, exhibition, you really should have... Uh, have a separate male uh, line breeding and a female line breeding um, populations um, because it, if you if this is homozygous for the barring that white area is going to be wider and uh, from an exhibition standpoint uh, the males look a little bit white um, and they don't look as clean cut and and so um, that's a good practical use of um, of a sex-linked gene that's homozygous versus um, heterozygous and hemizygous in the case of the, the female. Now, another sex-linked uh, gene that is, is pretty classic, and that's our, um, our gold gene. Um, silver is dominant, the uppercase S, and uh, again, you can um, you cross this a gold male with a silver female of any kind, um, whether it's uh, a barred rock or some other sort of silver female, and um, they'll they'll come out where there's some silver on the males and the females will be gold. And this is another way of being able to sex uh, birds at um, an early age. Let's talk a little bit about the, the party colored birds. As I mentioned, the black breasted red color pattern, which is uh, is the gold, is the, it's got the gold gene also, so it's got um, reddish hackle, reddish saddle hackles, and some red in the, the wings, and then the, the body and the tail are, are, are black. And um, this is what the wild uh, type jungle fowl would, would basically look like. However, with, with some breeding and and uh, a little bit of a change. Let's say that we put that inhibitor gene in there um, that inhibits black, and so all areas that would would be black on the on the regular black breasted red are now white, and we come up with a pile um, pattern. In this case, the red pile. And so, as you're looking at different breeds and varieties of, of birds, kind of keep these things in mind that there's there's actually these complementary type uh, basic patterns, and and then they're uh, a lot of of different um, colors are are um, shot off of those. Um, one thing I wanted to mention. Oh yeah, here we have um, on that wild type. Uh, here's a typical black-breasted red pattern, or very se or close to one. Uh, this is actually a um, well summer um, male bantam, and there's the the females. Um, you, you notice right off the females and the males look completely different, and this, this is called sexual dichromatism. And if you stop and think about that, is in an evolutionary uh, aspect, the jungle fowl females are the ones sitting on the on the nest of eggs, and they're a lot less likely to be spotted than the than the female with or the male with his uh, his bright colors. And so we have um, endocrine aspects that affect the actual phenotypic display of genes also. And uh, this is a good example of that. Now, um, one interesting gene that was uh, touched on earlier is the Wheaton gene. And uh, if you put a Wheaton gene on, on uh, birds, uh, particularly black-breasted red uh, color uh, type 
birds, it inhibits um, certain areas of black formation in the, in the females and doesn't really affect the male all that much, uh, other than maybe in some uh, uh, variation in intensity of color in, some, uh, in the red areas of the body. Uh, it's a very pretty gene. I wish I had a picture of it. Um, I used to raise Wheatons um, in my younger days, and uh, they were one of my favorite. But uh, they have the color of kind of like um, wheat or, or a, a straw color, and all that they really have is black, some black in the wings and some black in the, in the feathers. And that's an example of a, uh, an allele of this, this E gene that is affecting uh, certain areas of the body. So with that information in, in tow, um, you go out to the barnyard and you take a look at some, some birds, okay? And, and now hopefully you're, you're going to be able to see a little bit uh, uh, of difference and, and maybe even conjecture on uh, some of the genetics of these things. In the background here, we have a, a Rhode Island red um, hen. Immediately you can see that uh, she's got the gold gene, obviously. Um, and uh, we talked about the Wheaton um, gene in there also. Uh, she has some uh, black in the, in the tail, and if you open that wing, she'll have some black in those wings too. So that Wheaton restrictor gene is probably present. And, um, and as opposed to the bird in the foreground, which is a bar Plymouth Rock hen, uh, just think of a few things that that thing could have. Uh, number one, it could it could have the silver gene in it. More than likely, it does. It uh, certainly has um, uh, black all through its body, and then it has the barring um, gene, which uh, causes that, which is also the sex-linked uh, gene in this case. And so, hopefully, as you start looking at some birds, uh, you can you can kind of start playing around with that those type of thoughts. Here's a um, this is actually a bearded, silky, uh, buff color. And um, they're, the buff birds that are carrying the, the gold gene are, are really some of the only ones that don't have any black in their, their um, parts of their plumage um, necessarily. But there are like things like buff orpingtons and uh, um, others. And this just happens to be one. And this, this bird is probably not the best uh, uh, example. It actually got second place in, in this particular show, but uh, um, you can see that it's a little bit pale on some of those feathers, but that, that could be caused by some other things also. But the whole idea here is that the buff goes throughout the, the body. There is one um, mutation on the E locus that's really interesting to me, and um, I have raised Colombian um, uh, barred rocks, to, or Colombian Plymouth rocks also. This is the, the Colombian gene that causes uh, some the expression of silver in, in certain areas, uh, and uh, you, you can see that the male and female look alike, and it's a very striking pattern that um, looks really good in the showroom, too. The, the Brahmas, um, the light and the, and the buff Brahmas are examples of that, uh, also, where the light is silver like this, and the buff is, has the red gene in it. And then there are feather patterns that uh, are multicolored. In this case, it's a millefleur pattern. Uh, this is a Belgian diacle, and uh, this is a very common um, uh, color pattern for those. And uh, you can see that there's the buff, and then there's a black border, and then it's spangled with the uh, with the white. And so. Um, uh, you can have some complexity in these type of things. If you throw in a blue gene, you can actually get this to be the black part to be blue and, uh, and so forth. And uh, so it gets pretty complicated as things go on in those type of things. Um, basically, the um, way a bird looks is dependent on a very complex interaction of, of genes. And uh, we talked about um, autosomal genes that, that, uh, that Parents carry two of those. The sex-linked gene, genes, the males only have one, and that has a big um, influence sometimes on, on how they look uh, phenotypically. And uh, so with this presentation, we've kind of just touched on uh, just a few basic principles, but um, go, go find a, a local chicken show and uh, just look at those breeds and varieties that, that are out there and, and pick some that you like. And, the best way you can find out about them is just is talk to the breeders and, and owners about their birds, you know, and maybe a little bit about uh, 
uh, how they're bred and, and uh, things like that. Then as you uh, learn and have some experience with your own um, birds, uh, try some experimental pens. You may be surprised at what you get. And, uh, and uh, you know, don't be afraid to experiment a little bit too because um, that's how these mutations come about. That's how these different uh, patterns come about where you have blue um, instead of black in a lot of the plumages. And, uh, and who knows, you may come up with your own um, variety color there that nobody else has, has had before too. And so the sky's the limit uh, on that. And um, here you see a, a, a small chicken show, and uh, you can see some whites in there. Now, are they, ex are they uh, dominant whites? Are they recessive whites? Uh, you might be able to tell a little bit uh, by their, their breed, but uh, that doesn't tell the whole, whole story. Here's a, um, a buff Brahma. We talked about the Columbian pattern on that. Uh, there's some black ones, um, some uh, black-breasted red. Uh, there's even a quail color uh, pattern right there. and uh, and so. Uh, just go down and, and look at all the amazing uh, different uh, color patterns of birds. They're, they're very, they're pretty. And um, if you want some further information, um, you can go to some of these references. And if you're really serious about getting into um, exhibition poultry, I would definitely recommend that you get involved with the American Poultry Association. And uh, we have what's called American Standard of Perfection. It has uh, in detailed account of all the different plumage patterns of uh, everything that's um, shown in the United States. There's also a British standard. And um, yeah, the Bantam standard is very similar, except uh, sticks with the Bantam uh, breeds. And just visit your local poultry show. There's a cool video that I found on um, on a poultry show. It's called Pedigree Poultry, and it uh, it was filmed in in uh, Britain, and it gives you a pretty good idea of what what goes on at a poultry show. Uh, however, there's a couple of things in there I need to warn you about. Is caveats and as far as sanitary and biosecurity practices go, um, please don't wash your birds in your kitchen sink and don't brood your birds in the house. Do it outside somewhere, um, just standard sanitary type things. But other than that, uh, you get a pretty good idea of uh, what a what a poultry show is all about. And um, uh, so, if at the end of this thing. My expected result is that you'll never look at a chicken the same way again, and hopefully you'll be able to have a little bit uh, uh, more of a knowledge of uh, what that uh, chicken is over across the fence to your neighbors and be able to talk to him in an in a intelligent way. And uh, hopefully it, uh, it'll also inspire you to, to maybe get into some of this poultry breeding. It's, it's fun, and it's a, a great, uh, great way to um, learn uh, the genetics, because that's the only way you're going to do it, is just practice, practice, practice. With that, Jackie, I believe that's what I've got. Okay, thank you very much, David. Are there any questions? You can type them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, either one of our speakers can uh, answer your questions. Um, I think that it uh, become very clear that, you know, I get questions all the time. If I cross this with this, what will I get? Um, without knowing the detailed genetic background of um, of the chickens involved, it's very difficult to say because of the numbers of genes involved. If you get into doing um, your own chicken breeding, keeping records is extremely important. Wouldn't you say, David? Still there, David? I'm still here. You you wouldn't know what you're doing without records, and that's that's extremely important. Uh, and have enough have enough pen space, have enough um, areas uh, to be able to separate um, what you're doing, like the progeny from one breed breeding, as opposed to progeny of another, so that you can keep keep those accurate records. And that starts right at the egg. You want to identify those eggs and follow them through all the way. Do you have any recommendations for references on breeding? Uh, not, not right offhand, Jackie, that I can think of. Um, most of this, most of this that I've talked about is just by 
by practical stuff that I've I had experience with. Yeah. Um, I can take a look around and see if I can find anything and post it when I post the recording. Um, and I also put it on our, um, let's see if I got this right, our Facebook page. Um, and there should be something out there on keeping records and um, how you breed what with what and how you keep records for I, it. Actually, that Fred Jeffrey book is pretty good on that. I know. Okay. Uh, we have a question. How is the barring on the Dominique different from that of the Bard Plymouth Rock? They look different. As I understand it, it's the same. It's, a, it's still a sex-linked barring. And, um, of course, on the Dominique, it's, it's, it's a V-bar rather than the straight across. And there's got to be some genetic difference there. I'm not sure just what it is. Dr. Karcher, do you have any idea? Um, I don't know. There, there's another gene, and I can't recall from my master's which gene it is, but it's more, it's, it goes back to the background of the um, Dominique versus the Bard Rock. So it's another gene that has an influence, and then when you add in that dosage effect, that um, can cause some of the problems that you see in the, the breeding of the Dominique. Okay, are there any more questions? Uh, while people are thinking about it, I just want to uh, put a word out for our next webinar, which will be February the 7th at 3 o'clock Eastern Time, talking about predator control for small and backyard flocks. We have a new uh, extension specialist here at the University of Kentucky, Dr. Matt Springer, who will be discussing some of the predator concerns related to the small and backyard flocks. There was a question on whether or not this was recorded. Yes, this is recorded and it will be uh, up in the next day or two. Um, and when it is posted, I will be putting that on Facebook to let you know. Or you can go to the the learn page for this and um, I can't remember what it's called when you um, you put that you're following it. That's it. You follow it and then as soon as I put it up, you'll get a notification um, because you're following the webinar. Again, if you have any ideas for uh, additional webinars, please let me know. Um, you can email me or you can type it in the box right now. Um, we're always looking for new ideas of um, webinar topics. So thank you, David, and thank you, Darren, and of course, thank you, Mark, for being here as our host. And I hope we'll see you guys, uh, the visitor, the viewers, next month. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you very much.